Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Talking Landscape Photography. We have one of my neighbour extraordinaires here on tonight, who I can almost throw a stone at and uh, and and uh, or rock around and have a cup of tea with. And he's also a bit of a hero of mine and uh, a very significant part of sort of my own personal influence and in, in terms of how I run photography. And and Luke can speak for himself, but I imagine there's a bit of influence there as well. Uh, so we'll probably. Uh, Lord kind of straight in, I reckon, to to Mr. Rob Blakers. He arguably, I would say, is 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 the preeminent working sort of high end conservation photographer in Australia. He's completely committed a huge part of his life into you know the conservation of different species and, and tracts of land, and his his knowledge of the landscape, the interactivity, the, the passion that he has in terms of to bring his knowledge forward and and to weave that into a publicly accessible approach through his imagery and his word presents a lot and and he's moved into drone and film as well as stills um when i first met rob he was one of the preeminent kind of high-end large format landscape photographers doing huge huge big uh trendies in those days which was a little bit beyond my my scope but he's um he's the kind of person that's evolved with the times and and launched into the digital world really embraced all of that's possible as well and he's certainly someone that uh, I feel like all of us in Australia in particular should know, if not the world. And he's a person to get a lot of inspiration from around the greater and grander purpose of landscape photography, in particular beyond our own personal enjoyment. You know, we all reach into the landscape, I think, and and get our own joy and, and health and well-being and uh, in terms of our own interaction with it. And I think it takes a certain selflessness and a deeper kind of understanding of 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 kind of the exchange, I guess, of the benefit that you've had and how can we give back. And hopefully this this chat in particular will, will give you a sense of how that can be done from a real cutting edge modern and, and contemporary perspective from, from one of the greats uh, in Australia. So uh, welcome, Mr. Rob Blakers. Thank you for having us. Funny enough, he's my neighbour, but I don't get to see him that much. I'm always right around for cups of tea, but he's He's too much to do, always busy, always racing off doing something else. And he also has the ability to read the weather like no one ever met in the known universe. Uh, so he knows all the exact windows to race off to all the perfect pockets of places, and which is still a bit of a mystery to me. So so he, he's, he realms a little bit on the on the mythical to me, Mr. Rob Blakers. And uh, if you had the scene, he, he was recently on TV um, on the garden show, I think it was, as, as Rob actually grows a lot of his own food. And and even offers a lot of it to, to people in the community as well. He's a man of many, many, many talents. Um, Luke, I don't know if you've got any words or, or, or you'd like to mention about your experience and influence from Rob before we introduce him directly. Well, I remember when I first met him in, in Wild Island and um, I was um, kind of a very, um, very nervous <laughs> when um, we, we popped in there after one of our Southwest missions, I think one time. And um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Rob's work and it's just uh, such a amazing to see the dedication that he has to, to the wild places. We we're just talking before the show about how he's deliberately sought out places that are under threat that um, even species and, and, you know, birds and, and animals that are, that are under threat as well and has dedicated time to photographing those when there's probably clearly more iconic destinations and maybe, you know, scenes that are that are more eye-catching to people, but he's um, been much more, uh, you know, targeted in, in ensuring that the work that he's creating is having that level of impact. And, and that's something that I very, very deeply admire about how he goes about things. And, and obviously is incredibly inspiring because of that. So it's a real honor to have you on tonight, Rob. Thank you, Luke and, and Paul. Um, the cliche is I'm totally humbled by what you've just said, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Thank you for the very kind words. So we, we spoke just before the show, Rob, about what we want to cover tonight. Because to me, like, we're not necessarily going to be, you know, like a traditional photographer's portrait where we're talking about your whole career from where to go. But it would be interesting to give people a bit of perspective on on sort of how you've come to where you are now. And I think the idea of tonight is to focus on a lot of Rob's recent conservation work in the last three years in particular on, on four or five different areas and different projects and different species and Hopefully that gives us a, a a real snapshot into the working kind of realm of, of a modern conservation based photographer, particularly one based here in Tasmania. So for me, the motivation comes in taking a step back. Um, you know, like all of us, acutely aware of what's happening on the planet, 
obviously with the environment, but even just, you know, to go politically, etc. We were in unprecedented, unprecedented times and in the natural world in terms of the climate crisis and the, you know, the linked biodiversity crisis, we're heading in precisely the wrong direction on both of those fronts. And for landscape photographers, you know, we're spending time out in wild places and you can see the changes, like I see them in the environment that I go out to in Tassie and elsewhere, and I also see it at home, at, you know, in terms of weather and so on, impacting the gardens that I produce. Um, and so the question of our times, what can I do? What can I do in the face of this um, unfolding train wreck, which is what humanity is taking the planet to? And as photographers, you know, there's one, well, you know, there's one easy answer. We can use our skills, we can use our interests and our aptitudes to try and change, make, in, you know, influence the people around us, make political change, make social change using photos. And like Luke and Paul, you both do that as well. That's not as if, you know, any one person has got exclusive use of that sort of concept um but i think that you know we can all do as much you know we do what we can we wake up each morning and we think you know what can i do in this situation and again as as a photographer there's an obvious step that we can take to use our our photography for for good ends then you move down another layer okay how do we actually you know what do we focus on with our photography and how much do we combine it with um you know more broadly different campaigns who do we work with all of those questions are ongoing and you know change through time but i think that's the core of it you know is sitting back and you know waking up each morning and think and asking ourselves what can i do rob would you would you be up a, a quick thread so just to me from memory a lot of a lot of the kind of uh, cementing of those concepts came from your original trip over here for the Franklin campaign. Cause I believe you're from the mainland originally and you came over, I think for other reasons and ended up being involved in that. And, and I'm wondering like if you, if you just sort of traced a, a quick historical thread about where that sort of those concepts sort of started coming into being and, and how they've kind of woven through to, to this stage of your life where they're really kind of dominating most of what you do. Yeah. I did, like I finished uni in Canberra and came down for a three-week cross-country skiing holiday uh, in the middle of 1980. And there was no snow, so I wandered into the Wilderness Society and that was just a year or two leading up to the Franklin River blockade. And so I sort of fell into that space and it really turned me as a as a person around, like I'd grown up in a fairly, not a conservative family, but, you know, I grew up in Canberra. It was a particular worldview coming from, um, you know, a fairly privileged background and suddenly I was rubbing shoulders and engaging with people who were experienced activists had a very clear view of what they were trying to achieve and I was you know I was, my whole world was turned upside down but ultimately in a really positive way over the course of a few months I just extended the time I was here and a year later I realized oh I'm living here and I'm so happy that happened um, you know maybe I would have ended up in a similar sort of space through another route if I had ended up going back to Canberra. But it was, a, you know, an extraordinary time in the lives of many people, and particularly over those next few years as the Franklin campaign unfolded, and we, you know, we were successful in protecting that, that river and, you know, pushing forward conservation in Tasmania and globally through that process. Um, and at the same time as that, after that, I was... I've always been involved in conservation issues, but I was doing over the next several decades, doing a lot more, you know, just going out and embracing new equipment, moving from 35 mil to six by nine to then four by five, and then a high end digital um, phase one system, just and, and, you know, enjoying the greater capacity of those more powerful systems to do what we as photographers try to do, which is catch an element of landscape or wildlife or people, whatever our subject is, and represent that using photography um, to make a story. And the 
technological development has continued, you know, is continuing in, as in, increasing exponentially, of course, through time. And now we're into this really high end, but accessible and affordable digital gear for um, stills, video and drone work or whatever. And so it's an incredibly exciting time to be a photographer. And when we link that with like our increased capacity to represent our subject link that with the increased need to represent the subjects like it's it's an extraordinary time it's yeah it's well, a privilege who, to be alive and, and who, working at this who've time. Been some of your main sort of influences over that time since you know that was you know how long ago 20 40 oh, 30, 20 25 i mean 40 40 odd years ago so yeah. there's been quite a bit going on in that time do you do you have any obvious kind of um load points and those time frames or campaigns you're involved with or certain people or other photographers or conservationists that have sort of shaped or influenced your your, um, your approach? Well, it's the obvious, you know, we all have anyone that's in Australia, particularly Tasmania, you know, Peter Dom is the first influence that underpins, you know, every single landscape photographer without fail, all, you know, we three and, and all the rest. But obviously we've all, you know, moved in, our own directions beyond that. I think the second influence is probably not so much even a photographic one. It's it's activists. It's people who work in all of those fields of campaign activity, um, not just you know direct action, but you know lobbying, public relations, fundraising, etc. The dedication, the sk the level of skills and upskilling that I see those people doing because there's such a clear you know, once you open yourself to looking at the world and seeing what's happening in terms of how, you know, we're negatively impacting the planet, we can either, you know, shield ourselves from that to a greater or lesser degree. You know, we can try and shield ourselves completely and obviously we'll get caught eventually or else, you know, we can sort of push it away for periods and go and do other stuff. But to me, it's just come down to, and this is the sentiment that I see in other campaigners and activists, you know, we need to do our very best right now. You know, we're going in such a bad direction. If we don't just work as hard as we possibly can, then, you know, why don't we do that? So that's the, that's the second level of inspiration that I get to, you know, wake up. You know, it's working shoulder to shoulder with these people who are incredibly dedicated, as I said, incredibly skilled. Young people, but not only young people, we can't just sit back and say, well, you know, look at the mess we've made of the planet. Thank goodness the young people are going to come along and, and you know, they've got the fire and the energy and the, the passion to fix it. We can't, we can't do that. We're all here still on this planet. And climate change, for instance, you know, five, ten years ago it was said, look at what we're leaving for our kids. Well, we are leaving it for our kids and their kids and their kids and their kids and the rest of the, well, um, the you know, plants and animals that occupy this planet. But we're also impacting our own futures even at my you know i'm 65 and 65 yeah 66 actually um <laughs> you know, and i can see the impact and i feel the impacts in in my lifetime i think for instance living here in hobart where you and i are paul we're at the, we're at the front edge and at some point it's going to be a wildfire a climate change induced wildfire or climate change in exacerbated wildfire that's going to you know, come and rip through this our suburbs and of course, yeah. wildfires have you know, always happened in Australia's history, but the the impacts of the of wildfires in Tasmania and Australia are, are absolutely exacerbated by climate change. So it's here and now, and in the face of that, like Greta is right, um, our house is on fire. And when our house is on fire, we don't just take a break every now and then and go off and have lunch or go for a go and do something else if your house is on fire you know you're there doing what you can put out that fire full time until you get you know you extinguish the fire and obviously that's not going to happen in any any time soon so i think it's then a matter of dedicating ourselves as much as we we can as much as we want to as much as our our, our energy is pointed in that direction but that's the key thing we also also need to sustain ourselves uh, as people um, keep ourselves alive and keep ourselves happy and so 
the good thing about being a photographer is that you can do both at once to a large degree. You know, we can go out and visit these places which might happen to be threatened, but until they actually get smashed by a clear fell or a mine site or whatever, they're, they're gorgeous and they're, you know, they give us sustenance and rejuvenation. There's the answer. That's a, a extended wow. answer to a short question. There's a lot there. And um, I know certainly um, it's been a little, I guess, quiet on the fires front here in Tasmania, but um, going into the El Nino, um, I guess it's only a matter of time before we get some more of that dry lightning coming through and and uh, wreaking havoc again, unfortunately. Afternoon, which is, um, maybe, actually. Well, yeah. There's a bunch of light for, for this afternoon. Yeah. Mm. Um, um, I'm also yeah, really interested. Sorry. I'll sorry, go, Luke. I was just going to ask about too, and um, one thing I, I guess um, we, you, you did mention Peter Dombrovskis earlier, and um, you may have seen behind me. I'm, I'm quite a massive fan myself. Um, the I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm assuming you had the the privilege of being able to meet him, but did you ever get a chance to photograph with him? And and um, I guess one thing I always reflect on is that the the younger generation now sort of, um, in some ways, was robbed of his um, insights and and uh, passion. And and um, uh, did you did you manage to pick up any uh, sort of uh, uh, ethos there or or anything um, at all? I think that like Peter was a very private person. He you know he go out and he, like he set this tradition or he continued the tradition that Alagus and many others in other places had set of going out with the camera alone and like that the reason for that is that you then get into your own space and you engage much more strongly with your subject the natural world the place that you're walking through the place that you're rafting through the place that the, the environment that surrounds you if you're with other people like human beings we're really social animals with we're, we're social beings and so we engage very strongly with other people um and so even in peter's lifetime like i'm sure he did photograph with other people but very rarely i think and he'd go out and he'd be in his own space and you know he's written like he, he didn't write much but he's written things like and i'm paraphrasing here you know at times he felt like he's walking in a state of grace and just connected. You know, he, he didn't sort of use that language, but just in a state of grace within the landscape. And I think we all feel that at different times. If we do spend time by ourselves or with, uh, you know, spaced from other companions uh, in, in a natural place, you know, in, in landscape. And that's what gives can give us a window into you know the more sort of the further reach of what photography can be finding things which aren't obvious which aren't subjects which have been photographed before and finding them at a time in a way um that is you, you know that you can then try and catch in, in an image um so whilst yeah peter's no longer physically around his work obviously persists and we can all take inspiration from that, even though we didn't, you know, necessarily share time with him in the bush, you know, when he was alive. I did end up, like I did, <laughs> I did a flight with him on one winter's snowy afternoon. We, we flew over to Melaleuca taking some photos. Like it was just this gorgeous after a heavy snowfall everything had cleared the snow across the southern ranges and across the mountains it was absolutely beautiful so we we uh together went in a plane and flew across to melaleuca and peter had a particular image that he was trying to get that next morning but the plane broke down the, the pilot couldn't get it to start before dawn and so it was excruciating for the pilot because um we we're sitting there on the ground it's a gorgeous you know mist and you can see the, the snow on the mountains in the distance and the pilots tinkering with the engine trying to get it to work. <laughs> Very painful for him. Um, I think I ran into Peter a couple of other times just in the bush, just by chance, um, but I didn't ever photograph with him as such. But yeah, the key thing was, and for all of us, the access is still there through his work and his, you know, his work in many ways hasn't been surpassed in you know the 30 years since more than 30 years since his death um the work that he did you know shown there on the walls behind you luke um you know classic images and many people or you know people have gone to those same spots and taken images and many of them are fine images you know 
There's been more than Peter's image of Rock Island Ben, for instance. There's been some excellent images that other people have taken of Rock Island Ben, but his remains, you know, certainly not surpassed. There's other alternatives, or you know, Lake Oberon and so on. The Western Arthurs, other people have taken marvelous shots from the same location, but you know, he was the first one there. He took that iconic image. Absolutely, there's something to be said for for finding those, or maybe not finding them, but it's certainly um, creating your own work. And um, there's a there's a whole another conversation there around um, inspiration and and um, iterations and, and things like that. But um, yeah, I think it's hard to hard to find a, a photographer, at least in Tassie, that that doesn't um, draw a lot of inspiration from uh, from what uh, Peter's done. And and um, I, th I think that just the stylistic way that he captured the images using the um, the large format with the um, being able to control his depth of field, um, which which we really can't do um, with the modern lenses that we have now, um, to the same effect at least anyway. Um, I think even just from that perspective alone, it's going to be hard for his work to be emulated because there is such a a unique kind of uh, appearance to that. But um, that's probably um, enough about Peter in that respect because we're, we're definitely here to talk about I'll yourself, Rob. I'll just make one. Yeah, I'll just make one quick comment though. I think about what is a lot very repeatable about Peter's work because it, it's one thing to look at it from a technical point of view with what he, the systems that he used, but it's very much another one to get the essence of the level of intimacy and sensuality that weaves through his work that just speaks massively of his relationship with the landscape that's been built up over a huge period of time and probably largely focused even more so, Rob, as you suggested, through that solo time that he's done. You know, most of his trips that I'm aware of are almost all solo and and often, you know, weeks and weeks at a time. And so there's a certain space that you can come into of relationship that I think that doesn't happen without that level of immersion and that level of removing of, of distraction. And and I get the sense, Rob, that you've, you've spent a lot of solo time out there as well. And I remember... A bit of a transition happening in that you know you started um, building the nature photographers of tasmania group and and all, all of a sudden we got invited with probably was 10 or is it 9 or 10 or 11 or 12 of us out at the same time and all of us were looking around going we did we don't check with other photographers what are we doing all that here at the same time how do we how do we do this and it was and i hadn't done it either all my time had been solo as well so it was it was interesting sort of that you were actually a focus point or, or present and a, a big part of where my first personal experience of actually the power of a collective approach as landscape photographers as well. So, so yeah, interesting. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you carry on from there. And, and then I think, you know, probably shortly Rob, we should start getting into some images too, I think. Yeah. No, just quickly. I mean, it, it can work. Like, I mean, they, that was nice. You go with a gang of pe like-minded people. I mean, part of the thing, part of the other half of the reason why you go by yourself is that just logistically, unless you're going with someone else who is happy to uh, wander very slowly through the land, you know, maybe walk fast for a day or something and get to a base camp and then just pot around the landscape for days on end, you know, days on end. And photographers, that's just the way we work. Um, so it's a combination, and then you've got logistics of everyone being able to come at the same time and so on. So part of photographers going out by themselves is simply logistics, that, uh, as well as that getting yourself into a space where you're more receptive, but it's also just or aligning everything up. And if you have to organise with a bunch of other photographers every time you go bush, you know, you spend all your time doing logistics and you know, actually go to do the trips when you need to when the time calls for it. It's, what it's what a, was your initial motivation around the topic in it? Sorry. Oh, yeah. I was just carrying on that N NPT conversation. What was your initial kind of motivation or or thinking process around the creation of that group, for instance? Well, it was Nature Photographers Tasmania, and yeah, really the motivation was pretty clear. It's to have a, a stronger combined voice for conservation because we, you know, we did various trips to document places that needed like the Florentines, some trips with the Tasman Conservancy, um, some World Valley trips. So all of these places were threatened by logging at that time. And so we were getting material together and then we were a voice. We wrote letters, you know, as nature photographers, Tasmania all signed underneath it. And like the extraordinary, or the, not so much extraordinary, but the wonderful thing about that is that when we were trying to set up 
nature photographers Tasmania we you know put the call out to different landscape photographers and virtually without exception I think there was one one landscape photographer who didn't want to join because he didn't share the values but the rest of us all joined in and you know so you had 98 percent of the active um, you know landscape photographers who who were serious in Tassie at that time, all speaking with one voice. And that in itself is, you know, a very strong statement. Yeah, I don't know where else in the world you could uh, you could claim that level of percentage of, yeah. of connectivity with, with conservation, you know, because a lot of people are, whose landscape work, particularly, in, I could argue, in the modern time, but it's a little bit more self-orientated or, or um, commercial an approach. And I think that's a testament to the legacy of of conservation and landscape photography being quite woven together historically in Tasmania and the precedent of the modeling that we've had has been very much a blend of the two. Uh, yeah. I mean, you've, you've been longer than me, Rob, but over 25 years, that's certainly even how I've felt and I've been quite personally influenced by that as well. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing, like as photographers, you know, as nature photographers, you're out there. And so you do, just intrinsically develop uh, a, a recognition that these places need conserving and that's why we're all at that end of the conservation spectrum um, and you also recognize that yes I've got a commercial interest I'm trying to build my you know career or in whatever form but that comes second and the conservation stuff we can speak on one voice and then everyone just sort of goes off and we've got our different styles within that and so there's not really a, a conflict um, People speak, you know, if conservation comes first, if that's the most important thing, which we all recognise, well, certainly at that time, and, and still recognise that that is the case, but it doesn't preclude people having their own individual pathways forward to, you know, make a living out of photography or, you know, carve their own little space or whatever. Everyone just has to be aware and say, you know, go with the, the passion that they've got, go with the style that they've got, and it tends to, to move apart, to differentiate people anyway within that broader, uh, you know, secondary to that broader um, thrust. Well, Rob, do you want to start speaking, about, speaking towards uh, more some of the modern um, projects that you're currently working on over the last three years? Like we've sort of got a lovely platform here for you to sort of expose and, and share and, and inspire people about what a sort of working active photographer can do. And I think if we weave through in the conversation, some of the elements of, you know, modern activism, the, the, what the, how to be really effective, who, who you might want to work with, uh, what kind of strategies in terms of short and long term, in terms of how to approach subject matter, uh, and be also, effective. Um, with how to, how approach. to work out. Sorry, Paul. How, also, how to work out um, where to go, and and like um, if you're wanting, people might be out there wanting to contribute, but um, you know, uh, trying to maybe find a project that they can personally connect with, and and you know, um, not necessarily emulate what you've done, Rob, but find their own, um, you know, uh, little um, uh, project that that they can work on themselves too. Yeah, Luke. The, I mean, the more photographers in this space, the better, and you know, we've all got constraints of other of you know another job or other commercial work or whatever but the more people that can step in you know more people full stop but the more photographers particularly that can step into different campaigns it's just the better like there's there's plenty of room for people who have got time dedication passion and the interest to sort of do the research and work out what sort of contribution could best be made um so looking back at the last several years, I've been involved in a few themed, a few areas, a few campaigns. One of them, so going back three years, uh, I was in the thick of a campaign, which is ongoing still, to try and prevent a lovely area of a rainforested valley in uh, in the southern Tekina area from being used as a mining mining tailing stand. So this is the Rosebury Mine company is MMG it's a transnational mine um, and they've got two tailing stands they want to build a third because you know the mine is continuing there are alternatives for them they can uh, they you know they could take steps to pump at least a portion of the mining waste back up back into the 
the voids left by the mining itself underground. That's increasingly the way that mines operate across the planet. It's more expensive, and so they've got this cheap option of piping the, the mining waste across the river to inundate this gorgeous valley called McKimmy Creek under 50 metres of toxic waste. And so that's what they're wanting to do. Uh, it's with the Federal Environment Minister right now, and she'll come out with a decision one way or the other, probably within the next couple of months. But the campaign began there uh, once that proposal was made public and there was many strands to it. One was people just being in the space occupying the site. Two was um, the research and monitoring of wildlife there. It turned out that it happened to be a masked owl stronghold. And so there was extraordinary scientific uh, work using bioacoustic devices to try and document the masked owl. And then ultimately we were able to photograph the masked owl in the middle of the, the site. Um, and then photography of the landscape itself. It's a bit, very beautiful rainforest. It just happens to be a place that gets missed in um, winter. <clears throat> autumn and winter mornings and so we had this fog filled you know in the right conditions calm weather clear skies you'd have for several hours each morning fog in rainforest you know from the ground up and so you, you know it's a recipe for for gorgeous light and gorgeous material there happens to be really beautiful big old trees there and so you've got the sun shining through the mist and you know backlight and particularly using you know drone technology using you know, advanced drone technology to just fly a drone eight metres, 10 metres above the ground. And so you're up in this moss, mossy yeah. canopy area with mist and sunlight coming through. It's one, you know, it's Nirvana for a photographer. Mm -hmm. So that was yeah. one campaign just, and they can show some images from there, but also then just to list a few others, um, well, the forest campaign more broadly, there's still ongoing logging of places in Tassie which should not be being logged, um, including swift parrot habitat. And then another example of a camp or another instance of a campaign that I've been involved in is uh, Robbins Island, where the second largest wind farm in the southern hemisphere is proposed for what is Tasmania's most important shorebird site. And shorebirds or birds of any kind and wind farms, unfortunately, just don't mix because the birds, birds aren't evolved to be able to detect, you know, a blade coming at great speed down, like if it's just a static object, no problem. But because the blades are, are rotating and the tip of the blades move really, really quickly, like hundreds of kilometres an hour, it's it's lethal for birds. And at Robbins Island, we've got, <clears throat> it's not a, a huge island, maybe 10, 10, 12 k's either way. And so we've got birds moving from, nesting sites to roosting sites to feeding sites and they do that 24 hours a day um, according to the tide according to the weather and so they're crossing crisscrossing the island at night um, including at night including in storms as well as during daylight hours and so they're very vulnerable to to wind farms so that's been a, an issue again um yeah they're probably the main ones that that i've been involved with over the last few years and the swift parent is is a, a multi-year project as well yeah, so that's part of the forest campaign. Area? Like oh, the broader forest. No, campaign. Wilson okay. area as well, Rob. Say that again. The Hewans. Oh yeah, okay. It's another yeah. campaign. Yeah. There's um yeah. mines proposed quite near to the MMG site, you know, about 10 Ks away, uh, in a valley that happens in the valley of the Wilson River. And the Wilson River happens to be the most extensive. Uh, intact population of human pine that remains in Tassie. Like human pines are still widespread through the southwest and around the south corner. But because of historical logging, um, they've all been damaged to a greater or lesser degree. But for whatever reason, the Wilson River was left. And so it now constitutes uh, the best human pine forest, so sort of stretching in a linear fashion down the, this river, mostly as riverine human pines, which are, you know, just amazing, amazing trees, thousands of years old, incredibly, incredibly beautiful, just these craggy sentinels to, you know, what can be at times a thundering river. It's just the most romantic, um, ancient sort of landscape that you can imagine. And so that's been a focus and it's covered by mining leases, uh, which, you know, simply shouldn't be there. It should be World Heritage, is no question. Wow. So just to explain the significance of human power to people that don't sort of understand, Rob, like, do you want to speak a little bit to more characteristics? 
Uh, they're Tasmania's and Australia's most long-lived tree. They grow for upwards of a couple of thousand years. And as I was sort of alluding to, even though they're not on mountaintops and so they're not weathered by wind and ice at all, they are weathered by just time. And when they're growing right next to the river, it's sometimes hard to tell where the rock ends and the hue and pine begins because they just grow out of these cracks and, and then overhang the river and their roots hang down and the roots, they bind themselves. There's one in particular on the lower Wilson River, just an amazing tree where it's right on the edge of a bank, you know, a four metre bank and the roots come down from the tree and then just go, you can see them from the river, they just go back into the earth, back into the soil. And that's what's holding a massive roots and this huge hue and pine just sort of standing up on the edge of this bank, holding the bank in place, but also securing itself to the bank. Um, and the floods that would come down there would, you know, challenge it every time, but it's been there for, you know, 1,500, 2,000 years and it's, it's worked so far. Just extraordinary, extraordinary ancient beings. And they're also very susceptible to fire and um, other environmental uh, things as well, aren't they? they? They're not evolved to be able to re regenerate after fire? Yeah, exactly. Like the other uh, ancient paleoendemic species of Tasmania, the hue and pines, pencil pines, king billy pines, deciduous beaches, a, a bunch of other highland pines. And so they're part of that class. And I've also got an interest in that area and working on a, a longer term project on that as well, just because these things, yeah, precisely as you say, Luke, with climate change, they're terribly endangered by fire. And the projections are that they, apart from those in the most fire protected areas, will get wiped out by fire, you know, within decades. We've already had two 2016, 2019, the summers of those years, um, wildfires which burnt human pine, which, which burnt King Billy pines, pencil pines, and drastically threatened large swathes of those trees. Luckily, you know, essentially, luckily, not by good management, the fires didn't do greater damage than they did, but that potential is, is there every summer. And as you also said at the beginning, we head into a El Nino year and it, if it's hot and dry and we get dry lightning strikes, you know, it's it's um, it's a great concern. Yeah. And the more we can do to raise the profile, profile of those species, the more likely it is we can get resources put at their protection, fire bombers, et cetera. There's um, images that you've got at Lake Mackenzie always um, sit, sit very starkly in my mind, mind and haunt me and, um, you know, just the thought of something like that happening in uh, the walls of Jerusalem or something like that isn't something that I, you know, I thought you don't really want to have to bear, is it? So, yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah. it's quite a scary, scary thing. It is really scary, but um, that's where we're at right now. And so we sort of need to work, you know, what can I do to, to you know, to take a tiny step to um, try and reduce that threat? Just a general question too. I mean, you've got so many projects going on and, and probably so much that you want to contribute to. How do you um, manage your time in terms of, um, oh, I want to do a bit of work on swift parrots now, but I want to do some paleoendemic stuff. And how do you, um, with, with someone that wants to contribute so much and, and has so many, um, you know, ongoing active interest areas, and then you've got your gardening and I think you shoot sports and things as well and, and birds. How do you sort of find a, a balance or... Um, uh, or is there no balance and it's just whatever calls you at that particular yeah, no, time? Yeah, totally no balance. There's no, totally chaotic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, certain things have seasons. Swift parrots are, have arrived now. They've been in Tassie for about a month. They come down here to breed and they overwinter in the mainland of Australia. But Taddy is, Tas Tasmania is their critical habitat because they require, they have very specific feeding and nesting requirements. And it only happens in Tasmania. And what's happening with the forest, the, the logging industry here is that it's, systematically removing the large old trees with, with nesting hollows and it's happening just earlier this week and for the last few weeks i've been focused on a logging coop uh, just west of jeeveston called in the, just in a place called the commandy divide it's an area that has been substantially logged historically um, but there's still pockets which remain of massive trees and it must plainly it was one of the finest tree growing places in Tassie because as you walk through parts of the forest which have been <clears throat> pardon me historically logged there are these massive stumps like as big as this or bigger than this room that I'm in now just wow. you know four five six meter diameter stumps um, and they've been they were cut with the old you know, cross-cut saw so they've got steps in them it's not it's not a recent thing it happened 120 years ago 
but the pockets that are left and even some of the the for the because that logging 120 years ago wasn't a clear fill with a mechanical disturbance and then a hot fire afterwards and so elements of the original forest remained far more elements of the original forest remain from that sort of logging than remain from the logging that's happening now and so the logging that's proposed right now in fact is happening right now as we speak is removing all of the last old, removing the, the the regenerating trees from that 120 years ago and the rainforest elements in the understory and it'll then get burnt and so it's a two-step process from an absolutely world-class forest with huge huge ancient tree you know five six hundred year old eucalypts overtopping a beautiful rainforest understory in two steps over a cent you know a century and a bit um, we're taking that into effectively a, a, a plantation a monoculture plantation you know this stuff shouldn't be happening in this day and age it's also and you get to see those big stumps lumbered through the center of hobart <laughs> that's right front. correct exactly <laughs> exactly yeah yeah it's oh, incredible um i'll do want to start looking at some images i think to, to so maybe sure. put yep. more of this to um to ground as it were and and we and, and then we'll keep the conversation weaving around Around that as well but i think uh it would be a privilege for uh, that would would be lost if we didn't get to share some of them with everyone absolutely yep so, and feel free to start wherever you like rob like it's yep. it's all it's all relevant and it's all going to be great to, okay, to look at and talk. So yes. just to, get this right to show some context to what we're talking about for sure okay so i started here is that working you can see that yep Yep. Great. So I've started here at McKimmy Creek. Um, is that one I alluded to? That's the proposal to dump mining waste in this pristine rainforest valley in the southern part of Tekina. And I mentioned the swift parrot, the uh, mast owls, I'm sorry. And we knew they were there because from the acoustic recordings which have been happening for the preceding you know, six months or more. Um, and to try and get images of them sort of adds you know just makes it all so much more visible as well as having the recordings and it took quite a few times we did use um callback so going to this location or going to where we knew the mast owls were playing their you know recording of a mast owl voice and doing that after we'd heard them call they've got a very distinctive screech call um which once you hear it and recognize it once like I wake up now if I'm in a forest and a mast owl calls, I'll wake up bolt upright um, because it's such a distinctive. It sounds a little bit like a possum, um, a possum screech, oh. but it's a stronger call oh. and it's it does have a tone difference. So you can't mistake the two really side by side. But And so we played this call and on this occasion, after having done it for a month, you know, for on four or five different occasions over a month or two, the bird came and all of a sudden this bird was there and characteristically so my camera is set up on the tripod with you know long tele lens um a torch as a spotlight and once i heard you know saw the bird come silently in and found it using the torch fortunately for the photography you know they character ca characteristically just sit there on the branch looking at you and so it was there for about five minutes while i'm fumbling around trying to get the camera focused on it um get the light and imagine the emotions <laughs> too strong not too, not too weak um and then the last couple of frames like the birds are so still this is a half second exposure um wow and so it's relatively it was, i think 600 iso um and so it's you know the detail is there in the image it's this gorgeous bird just sitting there looking and unmoving and then five how, how did you like it rob so, say again how did you light it? Oh, just using a torch. I've got a, a, a decent a headlamp, um, a zoom yeah. beam. So you obviously, it's not something you want to do too much because there's no question, you know, this is not good for an owl to have a, a torch shone into its face. But, and I wouldn't do it for any other purpose than, you know, a purpose which is going to help their conservation. Like these owl, this owl family, it's our population and this valley is directly you know it would be wiped out by the tailing stamp for went ahead and so on that basis we felt that we can justify 
on a couple of occasions, doing this, you know, inflicting this upon the owl to try and get good images. Um, would have now done it two or three times and got you know a handful of strong images and some video. And so I probably wouldn't I wouldn't go back there and do it again because the need is now passed. Is it uh, something that would work with infrared as well? Do you think? It doesn't. I guess you'd get black and white picture, it, but it needs to be. Yeah, it needs to be quite bright because you know it's not that it's maybe fifteen meters away. Um, originally, I tried putting a, a red filter in front of the torch, but the light just gets cut down too much. Mm. Um, and I don't know if it like it's, you know, the bird was sitting there looking. It's not. It's it's not, it's not a super bright flashlight. Um, yeah. The bird, of course, could leave at any time, which is what it did in the end. Um, but character, characteristically, they'll come and they'll sit there looking at you for you know 10, 15 minutes, and then they'll just they've had enough and they'll fly away, and you won't disturb them anymore. So I guess again, too, um, exposure settings would make it look brighter too, with the half a second and and all of that as well. That's that's going to amplify the the light that's there. So there's that to consider as well. Yeah, as well. yeah. Okay. So it's not it's not a grainy image at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's and good. obviously using Topaz or similar software, you can get rid of any grain that there is quite effectively now. Again, these are uh, advancing technologies which enable us to be more effective. Mm. So, um, so all of this little selection of images is from uh, McKimmy Creek and also from the mining. This is a hue and pine. This is a hue and pine which is pretty much as big as any hue and pine that's ever been measured. And it happens to be right there on the Wilson River and that's right in the mining lease. Um, absolutely gorgeous trees. You can't really see the scale from this, but it's uh, almost two meters diameter, this tree. Um, just this beautiful, you know, beautiful presence in the forest. A few of us, the way this tree was discovered is that a few of us were walking up the river, looking at the, the river in hue and pine and you know quite mesmerized by the ones which are overhanging the water and then one in the group um he was looking the other way who's he happened to be looking sort of you know away from the river and this tree is maybe 20 meters away from the river and he saw it and just said this is incredible and so we all turned our gaze to this tree and yes it was incredible um and so we went and and had a good look at it and just this beautiful sentinel of the forest must be good what a couple of thousand years old then yeah yeah estimated you know probably up to two and a half thousand years old there was one of a similar size just going back to that one uh, measured in a different location just in the next valley across and they did a which i probably wouldn't do and i don't think it's done anymore they did a drill core i wouldn't do this um a drill core to get uh, you know, a tube to count the, the rings, and they got to they, they, the the drill. Their core wasn't long enough, so they didn't get to the center of the tree. But they yeah. had it over two thousand years. So jumping back to McKimmy Creek, this is what I was talking about before. Flying this is the drone image, um, flying it like the drone is just, you know, carefully taken up through the rainforest canopy or the lower rainforest canopy, and it's maybe ten meters above the ground. You can see it's a misty morning, still the mist is clearing. And at that zone, you've got, you know, these. this is a big myrtle that's probably 500 years old. And through that time, on these long-lived trees, and particularly in, you know, it also happens particularly in Hewitt Pines, you get this intense build-up of, of mosses and ferns and other life, including, you know, celery top pines or whatever, high up in the canopy like this. And it's a zone where it gets moisture from the rain, from the mist, it gets sunlight, um, and it's just a zone full of life. And so it's only in the last handful of years since drone technology has come to you know, advance to, to where it is now have we been able to get there and document like this. Because prior to that, you know, you can fly a chopper above a canopy, but obviously you can't, down, can't come down below the canopy. And from the ground, you simply don't see this view. It's, it's an extraordinary fascinating fertile area to be photographing in yeah. so jumping back to um the wilson river and this is a, a hue and pine grove so all of those trees those that little castle of trees in in the middle there is probably all, almost a, certainly the same tree the same genetic makeup of oh, a, a clonal colony yeah 
it's a clonal colony exactly yeah. yeah and so in this valley um it's a little bit different from most of the human pines is that it's away from the river by about 100 meters so it's just a, a river Ooh. river flat and you get these little castles of craggy human pines growing up um just beautiful. it's often um that's the phenomenon too i think that where they sometimes say that hewan pines are one of the oldest trees in the world because if you consider them as a clonal colony and the the organism itself might be ten thousand years old because it's been regenerating itself and so it's still been alive for that period it may not be the same uh, tree trunk that you're seeing today but it's been there for that long so um i find that quite a fascinating thing to to what you're seeing there is actually one organism it's not multiple trees at all which is, is a really amazing thing what you know changes the way your brain works a little bit yeah and that's exactly right luke um you know one could almost say it's effectively immortal because of precisely that if one of these if a branch falls off or a tree gets blown over in the wind you know other New, new trees will grow out of its roots and even so coming down a river if a branch breaks off um, it can actually re-establish itself along the river so you've just got this uh, extraordinary ongoing life and it's a fascinating species because this river the Wilson River runs parallel to another river called the Huskisson River which is just about 10 k's to the east and the Wilson has from a certain point in its headwaters human pines all the way down till it runs into the Pine and Dam um, the Huskisson 10 k's to the east has no hue and pines. So one just wonders how on earth, like as if a bird dropped a seed. Yeah, I've, I've never seen any down there. I've spent a lot of time down there. So I, was, I feel yeah, no, the, the, miners, the miners didn't get up there, was it? And the, they just didn't get no, to it's the not even that. They're simply not there because even, even on the rivers where pines have gone to in the south, you know, further south and southwest national park, um, Below where there's a source of human pines, you'll always find seedlings. Like right. the seedlings are carried down on the river. And so if there's human pines in the headwaters, they will be like the, the mature trees might have all been logged out. But unless it's been burnt down to water level, which yeah, might be a fire at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess it never got there. Yeah. Um, because it's, you know, the, Hus the Huskisson is rainforest, rainforested okay. the whole way down, as is the Wilson. Like they're very similar in terms of yeah. how they flow. Um, and as I said, they're so close to each other, but at some point a seed source occurred in the headwaters of the Wilson here, but didn't occur in the Huskisson. So in just amazing. an extraordinary natural history. And they just look so, um, you know, healthy as well, so full of life. Yeah, you yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Again, so I'm jumping sort of back to the between these two locations, the Wilson River and McKimmy Creek, where the, the tiding stand is. This is back at McKimmy Creek. And again, just an example of flying the drone amongst this myrtle canopy and i think there's much more to be done in this space because the shapes are so gorgeous the life is so vibrant and unseen by us it's just a fascinating space have you been tempted rob by the newer drones that have more of a telephoto um capability yeah so i've got one like i've got ah. you know, three pro and yeah it does that nice. like i you know hopefully the next one they'll actually have the the telly um with you know coupled with a, a better sensor but even with the tiny tiny sense that the telly has on the, the mavic 3 pro like you can for certain subjects it's fine and you can also stitch using a, a short there's, there's three lenses and one's a short telly and one's a slightly longer telly but even the short telly you can stitch your images more easily than you can with a, a wide angle lens um and mm. you know get good stitched images and then hence increase the file size so this is you know, taken above the canopy in the same place. This is where the, the tailing stand is proposed for. Uh, and this would have been, it's not a single shot, it's probably six or eight um, images with a, the wide angle lens then stitched together. And the stitching software obviously is really good nowadays. And so mm -hmm. you can get a, you know, a coherent image. What do, you, what do you use to stitch your drone shots, Rob? I use um, PT GUI. PT GUI. A real yeah. shame that the way that they take at least the three by three, it it turns on the edges so that you can't really stitch it in um, Lightroom very easily. It used yeah. to be so much easier with the Mavic Two, but anyway, I think PT GUI yeah. can do it well enough. Yeah, like you're often juggling, not so much with these broad landscapes, but if you're closer to the subject matter, you know, you're often juggling and even having to clone, which obviously one tries to avoid at all costs. But if there's just one trunk that 
isn't in the right place, you can climb it back into the right position. Uh, but far better if you don't have to do that sort of fiddling and for, mm. for, for, for you know big broad shots like this again this is a climbed image but uh, it is yeah. a um a stat uh, an image a, 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 a stitched image but you can't really tell it and it's you know that's what the landscape looks like you, you end up with a, an accurate rendition so this is the wilson so all of that that river and directly in the center at the bottom is a hue and pine um, enclave and then all down the rivers is hewn pines and you can see in the background which is the headwaters of the Wilson it's it's a rugged country a trip I did there three or four years ago we came down into it from the top and then a front came through and the river rose and it was um, totally petrifying just coming down through this thundering canyons with hewn pines and water rising and the rain sweeping down and across an amazing ridge line there too that just yeah, yeah yeah gorgeous knife ridges and the extraordinary yeah. thing is like that one on the left it's clear open understory walking um okay the one on the right. sorry yeah oh it's just saying that's that's special when you come across that in those kind of landscapes yeah yeah it's quite amazing back to mckimmy creek beautiful ancient rainforest and again on a misty morning uh, you know four or five four or five hundred year old myrtle this one jumping a bit further north into the Tarkine. Um, you know, this is what that country is all about. Like it's Australia's largest cool temperate rainforest and there's so many streams and rivers and, you know, interesting enclaves. And although it's all, you know, in a very blunt scale of a type, it's all cool temperate rainforest. There's so much variety in it and like, yeah, each different region. Where does, it, where does it sit at a global? I've heard lots of different statements about the size and significance of it as a cool temperate rainforest globally. Where does it sit in terms of the world? The world I know there's some pretty big one in Canada still, but it's it's I've heard it's either the largest or one of the largest in the southern hemisphere. What's what's your take? It's I think it's the lot yeah, to be honest, I should know this, but I'm, <laughs> that's a good question, Luke and um Paul and I'll go away and research as soon as we finish this show. Um, it's certainly the largest. Probably depends industry. how you define it's, it, too, of course. It's, yeah, yeah, it's the second largest rainforest per se in Australia. Uh, it's only exceeded by the wet tropics in total, so it, um, you know, which which stretches in pockets for a long way. But it's larger than the Daintree, Daintree rainforest, for instance. Um, and the other thing about Tekina is that, yes, it's sort of mapped for convenience between, you know, north of the Pyman River, south of the Arthur River and west of the Murchison Highway. But it has tendrils which, which extend, you know, obviously into the Lake Cradle Mountain Lake Clear National Park and all the way south into the Cradle Mountain, to, into the Southwest National Park. So it's not as if the rainforest ends. It's like it's it's a, a beast that extends beyond its more formal boundary in northwest Tasmania. Yeah. Yep. Head out there in a couple of weeks again. Yeah. Lucky. 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 Okay. So that's that one. Um, let me go to. I'll go for diversity to swift parrots. So last summer, this time, starting this time last summer and going through into February, um, having seen someone else, a guy called Tim Cooper, who climbed a tree just on a couple of occasions and taking photos of swift parrots, I thought, you know, we really need to do this. And we can, it's, you know, we can do this at a high level. And so I learned how to climb a tree and hitched, you know, dragged up a big long lens and hung on a, hung in a harness um supported by a couple of branches at this site which was a, a swift turned out to be a swift parrot hangout site for whatever reason like this this branch this stag um extended just above the, the more general forest canopy and it had a hole in it which turned out to be a nesting hollow but for whatever reason it was a hangout spot for swift parrots and i think because it did extend they'd come here after rain or when it's misty and they'd sit up there and preen and shake the water off themselves and then disappear again but that during wet weather they'd be up here frequently and so i'm just perched in a tree 10 15 meters away about actually just under 15 um training the the telephoto lens on on this site and so the birds would come 
to this location, to this area, this, this patch of forest, and particularly to this particular tree uh, repeatedly. Um, and so it's you know, just wonderful opportunity to be there photographing these gorgeous animals. Oops. Mm -hmm. So we um, have a question, Rob. You just sort of very matter of fact just said, oh, yeah, I learned how to climb a tree. I mean, how did you <laughs> feel when you... I mean, I'd, I'd love to do that myself, but I, I don't even know if I've got the courage to do something like that. Like, how is it? Is it more just like you got, you know, you're just so determined to get these pictures that you know the the trees just something you need climbing to just to get get it you know over and done with, or like how did you feel when you first started to do it? Um, it is very very safe. Like the um, you know the environment movement, particularly the Bob Brown Foundation in Tassie, has really made an art of tree climbing and there's other groups such as you know steve and jen with the tree projects mm -hmm. who are climbing you know, these you know the biggest of the tasmanian trees and documenting it and measuring etc cetera, etc cetera. and there's also this whole community of mostly arborists who do recreational tree climbing so there's there's quite a strong tradition and then overseas it happens also like in the redwoods in the u.s um and the protocols are very clear and you don't break the protocols. Um, the, the gear has got fails, like it's it's strongly over-engineered to be able to you know, hold your weight. Even, you know, um, you're not so much, unlike rock climbing, you know, ideally you're not falling at all. And so that the rock, the rope isn't being subjected to, sho to shocks. And so if you, if you follow all the protocols absolutely precisely and consistently and check them every single time, um, there's really, I don't, yeah, I don't think you don't, you don't have to feel fear, like, because I mean, it's really quite extraordinary. You climb up this, you know, you make your way up this tree and you get yourself into the canopy and you can see, you know, elements which you can't see from the ground. It's like what I was saying with the drone, you're up there amongst a different sort of sub environment, a sub habitat of the forest itself and in this location in, in this you know situation you're also up there with the nesting parrots um and that's amazing so this was the second site that we ended to ended up at a, a second logging coop um and this was this is the pair that successfully raised three three young chicks and so we located it fairly on fairly early on in the summer and then climbed and just observed and the female is initially in, in the tree hollow, um, incubating the eggs. Then, then after the eggs have hatched, both birds are out foraging and bringing back food for the chicks. And they'll there's a particular pattern that they follow when they're coming in every half hour or hour or two hours to feed the chicks. They'll go through a particular routine. And it, once you observe that, you can have a chance of um, having your camera pointed in the right direction to, to photograph these gorgeous birds. I mean, they're so beautiful. You know, the most amazing colours, don't they? It's like someone they've found um someone's paint set and just like decided to have a bird bath in there or something. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. and even when you take away the reds and the yellows, like the, the shades of green in this bird. So this is this is a bird like the nest is just a couple of meters to the left, and there's this branch that the birds would consistently come and land on, and then sort of sidle quickly down, and then hop across to um, where they could, you know standing next to the nest and they can regurgitate and feed the chicks and so this was always you try and pick up the bird as it's coming in but often the first thing you'd see is it's landed on this branch and it's quickly sidling down so you have to really quick to you know get your lens on the subject focused and start shooting as quickly as you can before it moves out of frame and what's your Probably, um, I, lens uh, of choice rob with your um yeah 100 to 500 i was assume uh so i had a 500 so I'm shooting with Canon cameras, and I've got the the R five, whatever it is, the, the, the more the modern whatever one. it is. That's Rob. Whatever it is, R five and hundred five hundred. I want to shoot. Um, say that again. Oh, the trusty one hundred to five hundred zoom. Or no, no, so I've got a five hundred. I've got a fixed focal five hundred. They actually sold that. Uh, yeah, I sold that. Um, under a year ago, and bought the six hundred because I thought, you know, that's a twenty percent increase in in resolution sure if you're using the lens a lot of course anyone would throw away the value of a small car to to get 20 percent better resolution so that's what i did so much <laughs> 600 and not cheap lenses wow they're not cheap at all in fact it cost more than i just i didn't get a small car i got a decent car and the lens cost me more uh significantly more than the very and pretty heavy too rob i assume 
I'm so forward for that. Is it a is it a newer RF one that's a bit lighter? Or yes. Is it one of the older? Yeah, it is. It is. It's a, it's a fraction lighter and a fraction shorter and a little bit wider. But the quality, yeah, it's definitely twenty percent or more improvement on the EF five hundred, which itself, you know, just a, a stunning lens. But the six hundred is, you know, it's it's they're just it's brilliant technology. There's no question. And so again, here I'm fifteen meters away from the bird, and it's pin sharp. And again, using topaz to make it you know, just to really optimise it. It's, you know, we've got technology in our favour, the wind of technology is in our favour to be able to, again, I'm just repeating myself, to be able to represent what we're seeing in nature. We could we can do this better than ever before and, you know, with the incredible autofocus on the, the modern cameras and lenses. And you're used to the, the animal tracking, Rob? Um, for the birds, I don't find it works quite so well because they move so okay. quickly. Um mm. You know, for birds in flight, yeah, but for these things, they're sort of darting around in and amongst the canopy in between branches. And so I just try and, and I've got a, a point focus in the middle and I just try and, you know, wrench the lens to be pointed at the bird and just blaze away. You know, you've got 20 frames a second, mm. which is pretty good. So this is a real crop into that stag that we showed before with the two birds. Um, and this is precisely what I was talking about before. The birds have come here during rain and they're madly preening and we've got this punk rocker up on the top right there looking back yeah. at me and just checking that i'm all okay oh, yeah. but... so this is the whole collection that's that's a wider frame of that same image so at one point there was 16 oh, of these critically endangered birds which have got you know well less than a thousand in the wild probably 750 or so in the wild and there's 16 on this one tree in this logging coop and the tragic thing is that you know you know what i'm going to say um oh okay this is a this is one of the fledglings from the nest which is the second location that we were photographing at and on the morning this was the first morning that this bird had left the nest and flown so you know they go from egg and they get bigger and you see them poking their heads out of the the, the, the nest or you know the hollow and the adults are feeding them and then at one point they'll stand on the edge of that hollow of 20 meters of the ground and they'll just launch themselves into space. This is the you know the miracle of the birds fledging. And so this was that same morning. This is probably its second flight. And it just happened to fly across and land in the tree that I'm perched in. So this is you know three meters from me at the, the closest extent of my big monster telephoto lens. Of course, the sun was directly behind it. So I'm shooting into the sun, the leaves are blowing, the winds you know, rocking the branches and I'm sort of hanging in my harness to try and get a glimpse of this view and of, a, of this tiny bird, mostly obscured by leaves. And but just what an extraordinary coincidence that it, on its very first morning, it came and visited me in the tree and was there for an hour or so, wow. or it flew off. But going back to the other area where the, that stag was, they didn't log the the nesting tree itself but they logged the forest all around it and this was a place where you know a bunch of us were going through december and into january and always there were birds there this is the place you know that we'd see 15 20 birds flying around the canopy and they they logged it it's just an appalling failure of of that it was even contemplated that they would log this place like all the records were recorded on what's called the natural values atlas which is you know the document you know the government run document documentary site for sightings and observations of um, of special species or birds wildlife and trees they knew that the birds were there and yet they still logged it and you know it's just a terrible indictment of forestry and it really speaks to exemplify you know what's happening in terms of forestry and there it is being logged and again bringing the drone into to use um, flying I'm a kilometre away, flying over this forest as it's been logged, and that's the, the the machine dragging the logs back to where they get processed and piled up in the log trucks and taken away. So very sad, shouldn't have happened. Um, we hope as a campaign that the loss of this place, and it will have a you know direct impact on the bird population, no question, but that we can leverage from the loss of this place to try and make it not happen again but so far we haven't been successful because as i said they're logging 
the same swift parrot habitat with swift parrots habit with swift parrots you know currently in the forest right now uh south of hobart they're doing that so that's Is pretty there... gloomy but um <laughs> it's it's what's happening i'll just show this wouldn't shot, there be I... like a like an environmental sort of uh, recovery plan for the swift parrot that would say you know these areas are critical breeding habitat and should be uh, maintained yeah so Tanya Plibersek and, you know, the Labor Party, when they came into power, you know, Tanya has been quite clear to say that the environmental legislation, uh, the national environment legislation has been overhauled. And under the current EPBC Act, the the logging industry is completely exempt from, from the laws which would otherwise protect swift parrots and other threatened species. Um, and so it's just crazy because so the, the chief threatening factor, which is logging, and that's, you know, well well thoroughly understood and not controversial that well apart from within the logging industry um but all of the swift parrot experts point the finger precisely at logging as the chief factor causing the decline of swift parrots and yet that same industry is exempt from the national environment laws you know it just doesn't make sense but that's 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 why there's been strong calls from you know many many voices to reform and redo the national environment legislation so hopefully within the next month or two those new laws at least in draft form will come out and tanya plibersek has said that the exemption for forestry and logging will no longer apply but will those laws be strong enough have teeth be able to be able to um, effectively stop the sort of logging that is still ongoing in tassie is yet to be seen so again building a campaign through photography uh, through all the other branches and avenues and styles of campaigning is really, really important. And that's why these changes are being at least considered because the the forestry legislation in Tassie is so weak that currently what they're doing is on the face of it, you know, perfectly legal logging, swift ha habitat, certainly when the birds have gone and even you know, to the extent of what's happening now, when the birds are present, they're still logging the habitat. You know, it's just an outrage. But it's according to you know, under the Tasmanian forestry legislation, it's it's totally fine. So, Rob, so, just two just two things quickly, Rob. <clears throat> One, if we're not talking or look, if we're not looking at photos, maybe don't share the screen or. Sure. Are you, well, I just share this one um, as a little look at this is a, the Tekina coast, and that just happens in my my screenshot at present, um, and it's just this gorgeous. This is you know a positive thing because up until a couple of years ago there was a um, proposal to allow four drives to come down through here, you know, this country, Wellpool, and that's effectively yeah, been stopped. And so this we're looking at a wilderness coast here. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's no four-wheel drives coming down here, or, you know, hardly any. I haven't been there for the last couple of years, but, you know, technically at least no four-wheel drives. And so we've reclaimed this as a magnificent wilderness coast. It's got, you know, birds, hooded plovers and other birds which are thriving on this coastline. Um, so, and it's, you know, obviously... A, it's also a hugely significant cultural value, arguably more than any coastline in the whole of Australia. It's just one big, long living site and... Actually, Luke and I went out there um, under the umbrella of the Bob Brown Foundation with a friend of mine, Andrew Phipps, and we took out um, Teresa Sainty and um, oh, here in the Nala. KIC, Nala, Nala, Nala Mansell, and, and we did a beautiful um, film project for um, four days. And it's so fast, the turnaround of the imagery, like within days, the imagery was being used in campaigns and newspapers and and we, we used the film as the opener for the Taekwondo exhibition. So it's... Yeah, it's funny how, you know, it's only really that sort of strip there that's sort of been protected on the coastline itself um, from from kind of a management sort of point of view. But, yeah, we were down there at Easter, which is traditionally the time that they all come racing down there. And to a fault, like they all stopped at the bottom end of the point where they weren't meant to be driving past. Uh, we did see a bunch of people driving up on the top of the dunes themselves, which they aren't actually allowed to do, uh, which can actually be, you know, burial grounds or different things as well. And uh, yeah, Nala wasn't shy about uh, letting letting those drivers know about, know about that. But but yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah, you're 100% right. Like that, there's absolutely a cultural landscape. And so it's got the two things, this gorgeous intact dune system and, 
you know, hinterland and middens all the way through. And you do get the sense that the Aboriginal people just left it, you know, a week ago because the middens are oh, so yeah. widespread and so extensive and so deep. Um, it's, it's just an extraordinary landscape. And because it's been... Like it obviously there has been some damage through cattle coming down there historically and also the four-wheel drives, but you know, that's been stopped for now at least. And so we have a substantially intact landscape preserving and protecting this beautiful and extraordinary and ancient Aboriginal heritage. Yeah, it was that was a nice positive effect. It was really I mean, it was it happened so quickly after our film that we probably can't say that that had anything to do with it because it was literally the, the news came through, but it was it was nice to be part of that conversation, contributing, and also the Takana Country Culture Spirit Project was a really beautiful one and, and a wonderful book to give voice, particularly to the, the cultural significance and the living significance of that landscape to the, the Indigenous people here in Tasmania. And that's um, I think it's sold out now that book, Rob, but it's um, yeah, it was mm -hmm. beautiful to be part of that. But I was uh, you were talking about this with parrots and, and the destruction and kind of the, the the kind of legalities around that and the change of the politics but from a very very personal perspective you you made a very personal decision to stand on the front line there at one stage and and i don't know if you want to speak about that but it might be interesting to explore that approach and how you feel about it and and, and the different sort of approaches of where you create the accessibility versus the effectiveness of, of conservation you know front line versus you know, accessible imagery that reaches the masses and, and doesn't polarise people, you know, that's probably a conversation to have in and, in and around that that event. You know, Bob's kind of put himself on the front line for the Swift Parrots and, and deliberately been arrested and, and you've done the same. So do you want to speak a little bit about your your, your choices and thought process and, and the experience of that? Yeah, so any campaign, any, yeah, yeah, definitely that's good. Any campaign to try and protect a place has got so many strands. Um and one of them can be direct action like that. And because I, I probably knew that forest where I ended up getting arrested better than anyone because I spent the whole summer climbing a tree, looking at it, um, photographing the birds there and, you know, walking through and listening and being there. And so I thought, um, if there's anywhere I'm going to be arrested, this is probably an appropriate place to do it. Um, and then the second question was, What's the point? Like, will it have? Will it help the campaign? And it took. You know, I sort of ummed and ahed because, essentially, um, you know, just getting arrested is no longer newsworthy. Essentially, all the, the media, all the mainstream media, ignores pretty much all of the arrests which are happening in forests in Tassie for the last several years. Plainly, each of those stations, you know, including the ABC, Seven, whatever, have all made a decision: we're not going to cover arrests because it gives them oxygen or whatever. Um, and so I thought that could be a possibility, but then I had the bright idea that, well, if I announce to the media that I'm going to get arrested, maybe that'll sort of perk up interest. And it did, it worked. And so under those calculations, it's worth it because it gives a platform, it gives a platform to speak. A, you know, in this case, before I was arrested, B, after I was arrested, and C, I've got a court case coming up in about a month. And... You know, we're doing our best to show that the logging there was in fact illegal to find that they broke even their own incredibly weak laws and, and prescriptions in, in logging that that swift parrot where all the swift parrots were through last summer. And so we get another chance, another uh, opportunity to challenge the logging regulations and to get publicity about the fact that logging is still happening and these gorgeous birds in their habitat. And so on that, that basis, yeah, I mean, it was quite straightforward. It was all very civilised. The police were great. Had a wonderful support team from the Bob Brown Foundation. So I just walked on and, um, and you know, after some time, the police came and drove it back down to Swansea and got processed and came home. And, you know, it was all, we live in the country where that, that still by and large, well, not, not totally, of course, but certainly in this case. And, you know, I, th I think in Tassie, because over the years, the protesting groups and particularly you know Bob Brown Foundation and and or them in particular have built good relationships with with police and you know it's it's generally a, a pretty civilized operation and a statement is made or or whatever and you know it's it's one part of our democracy in action. Rob, do you want to explain to people who may not know how the laws around 
protesting have recently changed in Tasmania in particular and, and maybe the ramifications of that for the future? Yeah. So there's always been laws against trespass and, you know, because the land is vested under Forestry Tasmania, the land, say, where I was arrested, you know, if I go on and I disrupt, but I, and I stop the logging that's happening there on that day, and there's a trespass charge, that's a standard charge. And then a couple of years ago, the state government, along with other state governments in Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, I think WA, have brought in new legislation which dramatically increases the penalties, dramatically increases the ramifications of, of arrest. Um, and so we don't, there can be cases now can be uh, viewed, charged or, you know, looked at under the old laws or the new laws. So the old laws are still there and the new laws are now in place also. So say in December when I come up, I don't know whether I'll be charged under new laws or old laws or a combination of the both. Um, but interesting thing is that in bringing in the new laws, the legislation also requires that the, in this case, the logging, the forestry needs to be proven to be itself lawful. So that's where we that's where we're looking. So that that um, requirement for successful prosecution didn't exist in the old laws. And so it actually gives us, you know, the, it, or it gives us another avenue to, to you know, to protest or to, you know, protest the, the, the laws. And so we'll do that in December and uh, see how it goes. But, you know, the, the, the penalties are significantly high, like the tens of thousands of dollars and potentially time in jail, et cetera, et cetera, which is designed to... Uh, have a chilling effect to um, to reduce logging, but I think that it's been voiced a number of times that you know, people are still determined, they're still passionate, and really, you know, don't have a choice but to step forward. And if it means breaking the law, then that's what that's what will happen. Mm. Definitely a, you, a challenging space. Yeah, I mean, I felt really uncomfortable when when those laws were coming out, and I'm not quite sure why they seemed to be very heavily targeted. You know, it was it was it was Tasmania in particular? I felt like it was a move towards the removal of of you know free speech and action on on a, on a principal level, and and then it was quite scary how quickly that got put through, and and sort of the precedent of what it sets towards the rest of the country and the world in terms of you know moving you know the empowerment and and upping the um the ramifications for for peaceful protesting well not sorry just peaceful protesting but just you know in general like it's i don't know about your thoughts about that because we brushed over that as the significance of that you know I, I i appreciate the fact that we've come across a positive aspect of that change but the motivation and, and the way it got pushed through by the powers that be it really really serves the the mining and forestry companies more than it more than more than the capacity for for us as citizens to um to have a voice yeah it was very explicitly targeted at well you know even the bob brown foundation not even, not not to speak of the environment movement more broadly it was specifically targeted at the bob brown foundation and their ongoing uh campaign against that tailings dam on the west coast so um but that is just one element of the campaign. Like maybe it means we shift, uh, you know, what you're saying is completely right, Paul. Like it's, uh, you know, the state exerting its power um, to enable destructive industries. And it shouldn't, you know, as we move in more and more into the climate and biodiversity crisis, we should be going the other way, you know, but we're not. And so it does mean that as a campaign, we have to adapt and shift, um, find other avenues, maybe more legal avenues, um, you know, using the better technology, our increasing skill levels, um, you know, our greater determination to find other avenues to, to make the points and to try and navigate a way to, you know, a better outcome, a better place than we're at currently. You know, obstacles are there, but campaigns are very broad things. 
I guess that's um also you know suggesting as well that photography is still a a very key aspect to that too because it's a, I guess it's not a a protest in its own in its own regard but it can obviously inspire and and um, help people uh, understand uh, a bit more or have their own help to form a connection that they have with that place that they may not be able to visit personally but they can visit it through the screen that they're looking at the picture or maybe even a print these days some people do see prints wow, <laughs> but um, yeah. So yeah, this, this... and that's that's for the sort of the viewing public, you know, people that are into photography. But you know, for those of us who do enjoy photography, it's still perfectly legal to go to like it is obviously illegal to go and you know stop logging at a particular logging site. But you can go there beforehand, and you can go there on weekends. Um, and as long as you're not you know breaking laws, you can be in there photographing, and that's you know without legal repercussions uh, in most instances. And um, yeah, so that's you know that that avenue is, is still open to us without having to break laws. And again, um, so many other elements of a campaign in terms of we as individuals where we can slot into. There's so many other elements, not just the, those frontline elements. It's it's a very you know it's a broad beast. It's a wide. There's a lot. Robert, of... Robert, where was that line specifically crossed? If you were there photographing, you were saying you have the right to do that. Where did you cross the line that it then inspired arrest? Well, so because I was in there when they were working and in fact, when they're actively working and it's, you know, they've got a sign, you know, you're not allowed to actually go on there either. But um, for areas where there's not active logging, it's even though they're scheduled, these areas <clears throat> might be scheduled for logging, it's completely legal to go just because it's state forest and it's zoned for logging, it might be zoned for logging next week. It's perfectly legal to go on there and photograph it. Once you, yeah, certainly obstructing work and also, I guess, you know, once they put the signs up with the signs explicitly say you can't go in, you're not supposed to go in at least on that route. If you want wander in from the edge, um, there's no one there and you're photographing and you're not disturbing anyone. I mean, you didn't see the signs, so maybe that's quite fine also. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's space that's probably, um, yeah, just... Uh, people need to make their own judgment i suppose absolutely no absolutely i'm not advocating yeah. people doing you know do anything but you know i'm absolutely making the point that there's a lot we can do even at that pointy edge and then going back from the pointy edge going to other landscapes which are scheduled for logging at a later date you know it's absolutely legal and you can there was a case um, that bbf took regarding um, usage, it was a case regarding access through forestry land to run one of their ultramarathons they ran in Tekina. And the upshot of it was that, in fact, on forestry land, um, they don't, forestry doesn't control access. And also it means we can actually fly drones on forestry land because it's not administered by um, parks and wildlife. So all of the national parks, all of the conservation areas are administered by parks, but forestry land isn't. And as a result of that case, it's actually legal to fly drones on state forest. Um, and so that's, you know, also good for us to know because we're not breaking laws in flying drones and obviously it can be a very useful tool in gathering imagery. Mm, that's that's um, Rob, interesting. Do you want to share some of, your, some of your images from Robins Island as well? Yeah. Okay, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to see them. Yeah, I've flown over it and photographed it from the air quite a lot. And I, I remember offering some of those up to to Scotty to see if that supported anything you're doing, but you, you're you the man on the ground. Um, okay. Here we go. Share screen again. Thanks, Rob. So again, it's just a bunch of... Robbins Island is, is exceptional, as I was saying before, because it it's Tasmania's most important shorebird site. And... It's an area that shorebirds from all around Tasmania funnel through to a large degree before they head off towards Siberia in late March. So at that time when all the birds are departing, there's up to 25,000 shorebirds on and around that whole ecosystem between uh, Stanley and um, Wool North. And Robins Island is, is the landmass at the centre of that. So you get these gorgeous birds such as this uh, the next stint, just about just a couple of days before it flies off to Siberia. Mm. It is How also. Did you get over it, sorry. 
how to get over there? Um, it's like it's a privately owned island, but the land ownership only extends to high water mark, and so below high water mark, it's public land. And also, as it happens, if you look at the land tenure of Robins Island, there's a little sandy spit on the northwest on the northeast tip, which is public land. Um, like it's only 300 meters, 300 meters long and 100 meters wide. But if you get dropped off there, or if you paddle a pack raft, as I have done, like it's an interesting um, place, because if you jump in at Robin's Passage, there's extreme tides there. So I jumped in on a calm day at Robin's Passage at dead high tide, and then got swept halfway up the island on my pack raft um, with the outgoing <laughs> tide. Um, and then landed, and then the tide was low enough that I could walk on the sand below the private land all the way around to this little spit on the northeast tip and pitch my tent in the sand dunes, which is exactly what I did. Wow. And then it's completely legal to be on that little sand. I've been wondering about this for a long time, Rob, which is why I asked. <laughs> and then from that little sand spit, that happens to be a hangout place for the birds. And so here we have a couple of double-banded plovers, which are New Zealand migratory species. Um you know, been blasted by this Amazing. gale because it is it is a windy place. It's a wonderful resource for a wind farm. If there weren't any birds on the planet, it'd be a great place for a wind farm, but there are birds and it's the most important site in Tassie. And so for that reason, it's not it's not an appropriate place for a wind farm, in my view. But so it's challenging photographically, you know, because of the strong winds, but you also get, you know, this is amazing, amazing scenes where you get the wind blown sand and so on, little red cap plover. Gorgeous little birds, uh, red knots. So these ones, all in their breeding wow. colours, through the rest of the, wow. of the southern summer, they're they're much paler than this. But then, just before they head off to Siberia, and this is literally two days before they left for Siberia, they they well, you know for the weeks leading up to that time, they colour up, and you get these gorgeous red, um, you know, red tummies. So these birds are just about to fly, you know. 10, 15,000 kilometres all the way through to to Siberia. Isn't it amazing? They've got the whole world to choose from and they choose Siberia. So it's, it's an interesting life, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a very productive landscape. You know, for that brief time, it's just, you know, these high latitudes, they're full of insect life. And so these birds right. are in heaven. You know, it's, it's hell for us because we're getting devoured by mosquitoes and so on. But, <laughs> um, for the birds, it's just food and a platter. And so they... They get there, they mate, they breed, and then they depart to head back to, you know, southern, southern locations, Australia and ultimately Tasmania. We're at the southern end of their extent of the of their migration. Uh, the adults leave before the chicks leave, so it's all an inbuilt inbuilt system. The chicks fly from you know genetically ingrained understanding and make their way back to the same locations. Yeah. Curly yeah. sandpiper. Or again in high wind just these beautiful beautiful birds this one we think might have left might have been left behind by its flock because it's this sole individual um, hanging around for a few days when all the rest had gone i'm taking it's been a fair bit of time on your tummy yeah so the secret with <laughs> these birds and you can see just by the angle of the view is yeah the, so you have to have to be on your tummy. If I stood up, like I'm maybe 20 meters from these birds, if I stood up, they'd all they'd all go. Whereas they're coming into land here primarily. And so you're pushing your cat, going along. You're crushing, yeah, you're crawling. It's a great, great stomach exercise. You're crawling and you're pushing <laughs> your camera mounted on a dish, which has got a you know a um a little column that your camera is mounted to and the big long lens. And so you're pushing that across the sound in front of you and you're following along and trying to get closer and closer. So we've got a few different species, the red knots, obviously, some bartail godwits, and I think some grey plovers in there as well. Well, if you weren't inspiring enough, Rob, I think when you know when I'm when, when I'm your age, if I'm commando crawling around and climbing trees and pack rafting <laughs> and doing all that, I reckon I, I'd be um pretty bloody happy with that. <laughs> well, well, well um, yeah, the, the slithering yoga is good for that. So you can, and also the sit ups, but yoga is is very good for you know maintaining. Uh, yes. Otherwise, you get there and you do it for a day, and the next couple of days you just you know you're aching. Yeah, muscles. and then there's more common species as well, such as these um, Pacific gulls, you know, but gorgeous birds in their own right, big, proud, regal birds that just stand there and look at you. And this is the um, 
Bartel Godwit, this species holds the record for the longest continuous flight. I think it was 11,000 Ks in like a couple of days, like just ridiculous things these birds are capable of. It's it's not a huge, it's not a large bird, but it just, once they start flying, they can't stop on the water. Like they can't just come and swoop in and land on the water because they they, they can't do that. They'll sink and, and drown. So basically once they've started flying until they get to their stopover places in along the eastern coast of China and in Korea, they're, they're, they're locked into flying and then they land. And the issue with these migratory species along the east Australasian flyway, Australia east Australasian flyway, is that their feeding sites that have been traditionally down the east coast of China and, and the swamps and wetlands of Korea have been filled in for you know industrial and urban development. And so that's a large part of the reason why these birds, you know, in precipitous decline down by 80, 90% from their populations of just a few decades ago. The other thing that oh. this photo shows is like these little, um, those patterns uh, of reflected light around the bird along the bottom there. That's salt on my lens because <laughs> I'm sitting here, it's a strong wind, the wind is whipping up a, a spray off the, the water, off the salt water, and it's coming straight onto the lens. Like it's just a horrific combination for gear. And so once wow. you've got salt, because what do you do? Do you, you know, you don't just get a moist tissue and rub it because no. the salt will abrade the lens itself. You somehow have to pour water on, rinse it off, and then start mm. the process because it's stuck and on. It's, it can't blow this it isn't off. The, um, the small car um, lens too. Exactly. Is oh, yeah. Wow. So yes. This was the first use of my long, my, the new 600 lens. And I, wow. I brought it back and took it into Welch Optics to get repaired. And he sort of shook his head. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you got to to bring eggs to make omelets, isn't that the saying? He, he shakes <laughs> exactly. his head at me all the time, mate. Want to bring my stuff from there? So. <laughs> yeah. Quite oyster catches. You know, it's a strong wind. He's got a tailwind. He's not very happy. <laughs> and this is the island itself. So we camp that little sandy spit in the centre oh, of the image is where I'm camped. I'm camped. Uh, I was where I'm photographing and camped in those dunes just to the left of it in the private land, and it cuts off that that whole sand spit. And and the low, the low water mark, but you know it's a gorgeous island. Um, and the wind farm proposed covers from that cleared area in the centre right across the whole entire swathe of the island. It doesn't go right, you know, it's offset from the shore itself. But the fact that the birds do cross the island, um, you know, to get from their different feeding and roosting and nesting site, uh, and, and not nesting but feeding and it's roosting sites, proposed to be. East, east to west across the middle? Where, where is the um, the actual stretch that I propose to build them? It's right across, like it industrialised the whole island. Um, so it, it covers about half of that cleared area and the middle and the top middle. And then all across to the right would be like a grid of wind farms. And then almost the most affronting aspect of it all is the beach here on the left is this gorgeous, gorgeous east facing beach. And about in the middle of that, where it starts to curve off to the left again, halfway down that beach is proposed a um, 500 meter rock jetty, which is where the, the turbines and all the heavy gear would be unlo unloaded. So, you know, breaking up this beautiful beach would be this massive, massive new jetty, essentially, you know, it would turn this quite extraordinary, although very flat island into an industrial site. And that's that's the objection. Um, you know, it, it's a huge wind farm, as I said, the second biggest in the Southern Hemisphere. Where, where is the status of it now, Rob? So it's, there's been an appeal. Um, I mean, the proposal was put forward, the EPA came back and, and said that it can only run for six months of the year because it's also the uh, migratory path of the, the orange belly parrot. And you know turbines and migrating migrating orange belly parrots aren't a, a good combination either. So the company appealed that, and that appeal result will come down probably in the next couple of weeks, like later this month or early next month. Is it so also wedge-tailed eagles? I've heard uh, as well. Yep, there's wedge-tailed eagles there. There's white-bellied seagulls. We saw them every every single day. And there's other birds, you know, down there on the left. There's they're black swans. So you can see it's quite. The, the wetlands are extensive um, and yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's ideal habitat for a large number of species. Mm. And this is the Eastern beach again, lovely light conditions, oh, looking yeah. up at Island. Oh, 
Um, this is about where the point where they put the 500 meter rock jetty straight out from here. Yes. So you can, you know, it's it's very significant intervention and transformation of what is at this point still a substantially natural landscape. Yeah, look, I was, I was just about to mention that it does look relatively um and you know unaltered. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the south they've cleared it, and that in itself, you know, the clearing shouldn't. It's a tragedy. It's in private hands, the island, because it hasn't been well looked after. The current owners are progressively and at every opportunity clearing more land. They're doing excessive burning, so they are degrading it to increase the productivity of the land for their wagyu beef. Um, there's also an issue around Tas Devils, because these are all Tasmanian devil tracks, and every, for whatever reason, like, you know, they're foraging species, and every night we'd come, you know, walk down this eastern beach, and there would be this whole new set of Tasmanian devil tracks. So they're obviously looking for, you know, birds or other animals or whatever um, as a food source, but and presumably it's, you know, worthwhile for them because they do it every single night that we were there and observing. So these are all, you know, this is half a dozen Tasmanian devils just running laps around, around the perimeter of the island. We put up a motion wow. sensor camera and there's one right there looking very cute. Mm. And currently, although, it's, you know, genetically the, the devils on Robins Island are linked with the devils on the mainland, currently it's devil facial tumour free. And if there's a causeway, if there's, you know, vehicles going to and fro, it's much more likely that um, there'd be, you know, transmission of the facial tumour to the to the to this you know, haven for tumour-free devils at this point. So that's pretty much it for the um, Robins Island. I'll just go to the other little collection I've got here just quickly. You did have some some of the paleoendemic ones. Yeah, but I've just got two get just here. Um, this is, you know, I've always, from the first time I got to Tassie, I've always felt that this highland country is just the most attractive country, you know, in its own right, but obviously also photographically. So here we've got Pandani's Myrtles. I oh, just need to get you to share the screen there, Rob. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. So I've got this missed out. Yeah, I love that um interplay with the the golden fagus foliage and the 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 myrtles or the um the the uh, pencil pines. Um, yeah, it's very very pretty. Well, it says it's paused. What's going on? You can't uh, see that. No, no, can't see that one. Oh, here we go. Resume share. That didn't work. No. I'll stop the share and start again. Oh, good. Uh, there we go. There we go. Is that it? Yeah, Sorry, we might have your um some of your Zoom um parts um overlaying, but that's we can get the gist yep. going on there. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, the. You do have a good yeah. knack of getting to these sort of spots at the at just at the right time, and often there's not a very big window in terms of um, these sort of sunny or or clearer conditions to to get the fagus. And there's often only a several day window where it all comes together. I feel. Yeah, no, it's very dicey, but and it's you know obviously extremely ephemeral. If you get a strong wind, all of the leaves fall. And in fact, there had been a strong wind, so that's far less dense leaf cover than it would have been a, a week before that but you know when you do get to the right place at the right time you get these gorgeous landscapes which are just glowing and beautiful and found nowhere else on earth and you know mm. at the same time highly endangered by climate change and it's associated wildfire so it's quite a, um, solemn a solemn thought to think that you know, you're also capturing, uh, documenting history and, and you know, uh, depending on what happens with dry lightning and other things, um, you're almost record keeping. And um, that's a it's a, it's not a nice way to think about things, but it, it's it's unfortunately like what we are actually doing. Yeah, 100 percent right. Yeah, we hope that it doesn't come to that, but that's certainly the case. Mm -hmm. And it's. The work that we do now in showing how gorgeous they are, talking about how old they are, 
um, as we said earlier, hopefully will redirect more resources you know, in the in the eventuality of a wildfire. So this is just the second of the paleo endemics. You know, pencil pines, gorgeous mountain backdrops. Mm. You know, this is the best of wild Tasmania in a way, or at least one of the best. There's probably many bests, but certainly this sort of landscape is so gorgeous and so special and so so precariously, you know, balanced right now. Yeah, it's one of those things too. Seeing the um, the snow on the pencil pines, uh, it almost has kind of a European feel. But you're not in Europe at all. It's a it's a really interesting uh, juxtaposition, I find. And and I know you've you've um, captured better than than most um, the especially some of the video footage I've seen of yours as well, where you can see the snow falling on the on those uh, amazing ancient uh, conifer species. It's pretty yeah, pretty um, amazing. And then you know in summer it's you know. 30 plus degrees and and dry and yeah they they have to cop a lot those trees yeah yeah and that's like this year i basically didn't get to the snow at all i don't know if you guys did but we just no, had I don't think such I did a poor either. year and there wasn't that much of it rob to be fair no that's the sign of the times the reason i didn't get because there wasn't you know one can you know we're still getting snow dumps and so on of course including some in the last couple of weeks um but to actually go out when there's deep snow um, is becoming a thing which is much harder to to happen. Well, you, you started the show with a concept that's alien to me the entire time I've been here. It's doing a, a three-week cross-country ski trip in Tasmania. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know anybody that's even considered that in the, in the last 25 years personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it didn't happen then, but it it's far less likely to happen now than it, than it would then. Um, that pretty much covers uh, the images that I've got, I think. I think that, let me just check if there's any others in the files here. you have a video you wanted to share, Rob? Yeah, so I had a video from McKimmy Creek, so I'll pull that one out and show that one. So, oh, it's paused. Yeah, but so, I'm not sure if you click optimize video before so maybe if you stop sharing and start again you can make sure that's that's ticked okay I'll do that, that, that. so if it doesn't work quickly then no it's still clicked all good we're in, we're in the bonus section now rob so it's all good either yeah way. it doesn't work it says it's loading. Okay. Is that working? Yep. Tekaina, the Tarkine, is a Tasmanian natural treasure. Australia's largest temperate rainforest. It's no place for logging, mining, or toxic waste dumps. Let's make this a national park for the people, for all time. Authorised by the Bob Brown Foundation Hobart, spoken by Bonnie Sveen. Okay, so that's a, that's a TV ad that we put together. Um, that that um, parallax shift of that tree was just oh, so nice. I loved it. Yeah, so that, yeah, we put that together as, um, and ran it during the, the test match that was happening in, in Hobart. <laughs> Um, a year ago, uh, it was uh, it's very accessible, like emotionally and and just contextually as well, which I think makes that very successful. I mean, that's that's a conversation we've kind of mentioned, but didn't really brush. You know, like in terms of if we pull back to the bigger picture as we as we wrap up the show, like where do you see the future of conservation in terms of? you know, your average citizen getting involved and, and where's that line to be, between the accessibility of a message and the polarization of a message where people start switching off? Like, how do you sort of dance that dance? And I guess it's up to you as an individual where your comfort level lies and where your style of approach is. You know, I, I've, I've been involved in conservation for a long time, but I I don't know if I want to get arrested or, or, or you know, clock onto a machine, but I'm very happy to be the voice of of the beauty and the and the spirit and the wonder of a landscape and, and you know through words and images and video and 
and I don't mind skirting the edges of those lines. So I think as an individual, we all have autonomy over but what role we want to play or, or how we want to get involved. But I think it might be nice to sort of finish the show on a sort of an empowering approach of if people are thinking about an idea, what's some simple pathways that they can start sort of applying themselves or, or connecting with certain organizations or, or 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 a way to approach a certain local project that would just leave a good taste in the mouth as we finish the show, I guess. Well, I think it is actually like it's, you know, it's this terrible polar, polarization. Um, the, the damage and the consequences have never been more dire. But at the same time, we've got technology improving on our side. And also we've got ourselves because um, Matt Newton took a cracker image of one of the protests of the of Mikimi Creek in the southern in southern Tekina. And I said to him, that, that's just the best image in that. That's just so fantastic. And he said, well, I think we're all rising to the occasion. And I think that's really a theme of where we need to be as individuals. Like through our lives, we we need to rise to the occasion or else, you know, as a species, as a planet, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it in any sort of shape or form that resembles what we've got now. And so like, we need to evolve as, as people. And I think that it's not just a matter of, you know, applying the same old rules, the same old behaviours, you know, it's, you know, speaking at a very personal level, we need to be smarter, more intuitive in ways that we've never, ever done before. And that can encompass photography, that can encompass, um, you know, the way we relate to the other people around us. And it, that's an incredibly open and inspiring prospect ahead of us. Like Einstein said that we use 10% of our intellectual capacity. And I think it's at this time, the need is that we actually push ourselves to use more than that 10% by being, as I said, more intuitive, more thoughtful, more determined. And that's like, that's an incredibly inspiring space to be in. Yeah, but there are some pretty amazing new technologies and, and people that are, are adapting. And I've, I've never really heard that word evolution being used to this approach, Rob, from an individual and personal point of view or from a species point of view. But I think that's a very, a very empowering conceptual way to approach it. You know, like life changes, you know, we change as individuals and collectively through the history of the earth, you know, the, the species that haven't adapted are the ones that have fallen away. Uh, because things change and things are changing and in this case we're more directly responsible for it than other species in the past that have that have gone on by the way but evolution is a positive thing like it's it, it has a lot of empowering and and um uplifting sort of aspects to it you know no matter what way you look at it so i think yeah, i'm going to sit with that word in particular for a while rob in terms of where i sit in all this but yeah yeah what sort of organizations rob are, are out there in australia that you think are open to new people connecting with or, or asking questions or seeing how they can be connected with from a conservation perspective? So in, I mean, I guess I'm most familiar with the Tasmanian-based ones, but, you know, the sway, the cross, anything from Tasmanian Conservancy to Bob Brown Foundation. Luke, you mentioned that, you know, the observation that the different uh, environmental organisations in Tassie seem to be working together more, and I think that's just so healthy, like it is, there's been this unhealthy polarization between the different groups called the Society BBF. It's another grassroots group called Grant. Um, everyone in those groups has got different perspectives, different skills, different ways to push ahead. And people, you know, we work best not by sort of being in lockstep, but by coordinating, by communicating and going with our strengths, going with our passions. And so, you know, so the Bob Brown Foundation, Wilderness Society, Grassroots Action Network, Tasmania, Tasmania Conservancy, you know, the scores of others, NRMs, um, you know, land care, et cetera, whatever, wherever you're placed, there's things that you can do which work for you and you can make your best contribution. And it may change through time, obviously, but just look out because working with other people is, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't do much by ourselves. We can do nothing by ourselves, but working in, in concert with others, we can do, we can do lots, which means that we will have an individual role in those different organizations or groups or whatever, but we're working, you know, in a coordinated way. Yeah, that's a, it's, it's great to, to, to hear that um, that's, that's happening. And um, yeah, it's, it's nice to feel like the work that you're doing uh, in, in the photographer we're taking uh, is also 
I guess as a broader meaning, it's not just a self-fulfilling kind of pursuit, but we can also help to protect places and and help to uh, provide a, a better environment for the future by what we're doing. So it's always, I, I always feel like I could be definitely doing more. Um, and um, it, sometimes it's working out how to to fit that into to what you're doing. And that's something that I very much admire about yourself, as, as I mentioned at the start, Rob, that you, you sort of thrown a lot of probably those other commitments and and things that might be nice to be doing and and really um asking those deep questions of yourself about you know what what am i doing and and how can i improve and you know what you know, not on my watch kind of thing i've, I've got a, a role that i can play in this and and that's something that um i'm sure that you know you're, you're going to inspire so many people from from that that sort of mindset and, and we really thank you for that Thanks, Luke. Yeah, and I think like we're all coming from different positions and we can all just do different things. And it's just a matter of working out what can I do? What can I best do? Um, yeah, and, and I think on the that polarization. Person, yeah, different for every person. But, and it, yeah. it has to work. It has to be, you know, have to be comfortable in your own space with what you can do. But when you do start, when you connect with other people, you learn so much from other people. Like I saw it when I first came to Tassie, that was what turned me around. And now I'm working, you know, a lot with younger people and just seeing the uptake the, the, the determination the passion and the uptake of skills is just so inspiring it says oh maybe i can learn those skills as well and you know you do bit by bit it's just it's you know it, it's it's great fun and you know if if you can align doing what you think is worthwhile working with good people you know good selfless people and using your own individual profession you know individual high level skills i think high level skills is is really important be they photography or writing or lobbying or whatever they happen to be, just extending ourselves, that evolution to extend ourselves, to rise to the occasion using high level skills is, it's exciting and, you know, heaps of fun as well as really, really useful. Paul, you said that when you've taken those photos on the, <clears throat> the Tarkin coast, they were used the next, you know, immediately. And that's really gratifying too. <clears throat> as landscape photographers, you know, we can go out there and take photos that then sit on our hard drives and don't really see the light of day, perhaps a quick flash on Facebook, but to actually generate pictures which can then be used to good end, be gratifying, a lot of fun. Well, I think there's, a, I think there's a, on a simple, really individual level, because you know that might be a leap for some people, like just be really thoughtful about, you know, we're, we're at a time in the modern age, arguably, where we have the potential for more influence from a visual media than we've ever had in history by a million miles. And whether it's just the phone you've got in your pocket or, or a bigger system, you can reach out to the planet instantly in a way that's never been possible before. So I think just being more mindful, if you are going to, you know, do a picture about something or, or post about something, be thoughtful in terms of how that speaks to your relationship with landscape or, you know, there's four or five different ways to approach the issues. You know, you can, you can do pure like spiritual ins inspiration, which, which leans into beauty. You can do it from an educational approach in terms of like, I've learned a lot tonight about the individual species and their characteristics and their physical pathways. And, uh, and then there's, you know, challenging people by, um, you know, literally just making a call like that. It's, it's, it's your voice, but there's lots of different pathways to do it. And I think a good reminder, Rob, is that, you know, visual is one. Your skill set might not be, you might not be the best photographer in the world, but you might be able to collectively write poetry or stories to go with an image or or translate that or connect that with people around you that you can translate your work into into written form or, or painting form or or things. And and also, you know, the technology we have is incredible. Like we how long ago did we have collective uh, capacity to to approach the world from an aerial perspective, you know, just about anywhere in the world. And um you got me thinking a little bit more about the the laws around the state forest and <laughs> flying drones, Rob, which I've always been super cautious about, and I'll have a chat to you after the show about that. Um, and also, I'm not, I'd say, like to add to that too, and just in terms of um, if you if you come into Tassie for a holiday or or um, scooting around, um, obviously you can visit the the famous and familiar sites, but it, it it may be good good chance to to seek out some of the places that maybe uh, need a bit more of a voice, and um, they're not always the the iconic places that have plenty of protection because um, that's what's generating all of the tourism dollars, um, and and sometimes you don't actually have to travel too far from where you are to actually uh, encounter some of these locations. And so maybe um, dedicating a little bit of time to to finding these locations and and taking your own uh, images in those sort of places and something that's a bit different and unique. 
And Robert, I'll I'll wrap up with a very personal thank you. Like, you know, you've been in my sphere for 25 years and, you know, even a simple thing like, oh, Rob, we need to come around for a cup of tea. It's like, no, I don't have time for that, mate. There's work to be done. And it was like, it's such a simple thing, but it speaks volumes to the level of your commitment and the value that you see and in, in all the time that you're spending in this world and, and alive. And, and I am... Um, yeah, at the times when I've been flagging or feeling a bit soft or getting a bit off the track and I think, oh, I wonder what Rob's doing around the corner. I bet he's not feeling that way. He's getting over the job and and getting things done. And, and you know, to watch this year where you put yourself on the front line and did it so gracefully with, with your arrest and and the way that you really maximised that opportunity and your voice around that, I thought was very, very clever, inspiring and, and, and very, very graceful. And, and, you know, in terms of reaching into the wider capacity of all the things that you could potentially do. But I mean, that's such a personally impactful thing to do as well with, you know, ramifications of the court case coming up. So just acknowledging your commitment and your willingness to adapt technologically, your capacity to build new skills into your approach, both through aerial work and digitization from all the way back that you've done. Like there's not that many people that are so widely capable of, and, and also in your personal lifestyle of, making your own food and living off the land and sharing that with people. Like it's, it's, it's pretty magic, my friend. So don't forget to give yourself a bit of a pat on the back now and again. I know you work so pretty hard, but at the same time, um, cup of tea is always ready down at my place, mate. If you feel like having a 10 minute break. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to take you up. I know you probably won't, but uh, I'll say it anyway. Come and have a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, Thanks for taking the time today. Um, yeah, it's been a really, really special show uh, for me, and I feel like Luke as well personally because we're um, it's very close to the heart of uh, who we are and the landscape we live in, and why Luke's come to live here, and why, why I've played this place, my home, and and the lineage that we're all continuing. You know that that's gone back as you very clearly said by the forebears before us, particularly in Tasmania. It's very special to be living here, and it really shaped my life in terms of. You know, I think from a global perspective, there's probably arguably not so many places where you would get 98% of, you know, landscape photographers, you know, ticking the box instantly towards conservation. That says a lot about where we live and maybe the ripple effect of, of, of what we can model to the world, I guess, in our own small way. And you're, you're leading the charge, Rob. So thank you, my friend. Thank you both. I really appreciate what you're doing at this show. It's extraordinary how long going and how diverse you've made it it's just quite and the high caliber of it is quite amazing we try <laughs> it's been it's been it's a joy just like stuff to do it yeah i mean this is our a little bit of our way of giving back rob because there's no there's no kickback for us here you know we're doing it for the love we're stuck to our guns in that regard and amazing God, yeah. three and a half years now maybe lucky i'm trying I've lost uh, it. it's just a, anytime you talk about time it just doesn't sound great now so um let's just say <laughs> it's been a labor of love and, and leave it there i think might be the the best pace but well, um I mean, yeah. it means we can get people like yourself uh, a wider voice too rob with the kind of issues that are important and, and relevant in the world today so that's uh that's that's pretty special for us like we can reach out or oh, who's a hero of ours or who do you want to learn from or what do we want to know about? And we can just go knock on the door and, and have these really special conversations and, and then obviously share them into the, the wider world as well. It's, it's, it's a bit of a privilege to be honest. No, you've done an amazing, well, amazing job. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Well, we'll um, probably leave it there. Thanks for your time. I think Rob's probably um, voice has probably hit its limit there anyhow. Um, but um, yeah, um, thanks again, Rob. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, if you enjoy watching our show, please feel free to subscribe if you haven't already and like the video. It always helps. Uh, and until next time, thanks again for watching Talking Landscape Photography and we'll see you soon. See ya. Good evening. Cheers, everyone. See ya.